3. Thank you for having me at this workshop today. I'm very excited to give a presentation about some of our recent work on how to make machine learning more trustworthy. This is work that I've done uh, in collaboration with many colleagues and some of my students. So I indicate at the bottom of the slides the papers that are relevant to what I'm discussing on that slide so that you can reverse engineer who are the authors and the contributors to the work that is being discussed. So let's get started by figuring out what we mean by trustworthy machine learning. The first component of trustworthy machine learning is security, where here we typically triage the, the, the work that is done in this area around three components, confidentiality, integrity, and availability. First, in, machine, in the context of machine learning, confidentiality can refer to confidentiality of the data, which I'll discuss later, and in particular, the connection to privacy, but also conf confidentiality of the model itself, because we're going to uh, often train these models with valuable resources, whether that's the data, the uh, engineers involved in the process, but also the computing resources. And so models can constitute intellectual property that we'd like to protect. And so we'll discuss in the talk later how to achieve that. Um, the second component has been perhaps the most research one, which is integrity, where here the idea is that we want to prevent our uh, machine learning system from being manipulated by an adversary that is trying to force it to produce incorrect outputs. So this can happen at both the training and the test phases. Um, for instance, in the, in the training phase, there has been a lot of work on uh, poisoning attacks. And recently, one of my visiting students, uh, Ilya Shumailov, uh, demonstrated that you can actually poison machine learning models without inserting any poison uh, in their training set, which is sort of counterintuitive. But what he discovered is that simply reordering the order in which the training algorithm analyzes the training data uh, is sufficient to be able to insert poisons, to backdoor models, and this is because you're now violating the stochastic assumption made in many optimizers, such as stochastic gradient descent, uh, that are popular with, uh, in deep learning. Um, of course, I'll discuss uh, some of the test time attacks, like adversarial examples, uh, in, in later in the talk. And then the third component of security is typically referred to as availability, where here we've started to have initial results uh, which uh, we call sponge examples, where we craft inputs that are designed to maximize uh, the latency of the model's inference at test time. And so what this means is that you can, uh, for instance, also increase the energy consumption of the machine learning system that is hosting uh, the computation. And, and so that allows you to, for instance, if you have a, a model that is deployed on a device that is battery powered to drain the battery uh, simply by feeding it specific inputs uh, to, the, to the machine learning model. And so I, I won't have time to discuss sponge examples in more details in the presentation, but if you're interested, I encourage you to check out the paper that is at the bottom of this slide. The second component of trustworthy machine learning is, of course, safety, where here this is a slight variant of security where you don't actually have an adversary that is attempting to manipula manipulate your uh, system. And so you can have uh, uh, sort of applications like self-driving, where obviously we want to ensure that the machine learning predictions are going to have good worst case uh, performance. And so we want to prevent uh, scenarios like this, where here a simple change in the lighting of the environment is sufficient to degrade the machine learning model's prediction, uh, which is predicting the trajectory here. Uh, and here, by changing the lighting, the trajectory is uh, completely wrong. A third aspect of trustworthy machine learning is privacy, where here, when we're involving uh, training data that is sensitive in our machine learning pipelines, then we have to be concerned that the models that we train and deploy will potentially leak some of the information that they've analyzed during training. And so one of my students, uh, Christopher, demonstrated recently that it is possible to tell whether a point was or was not included in the training set of a machine learning model simply by having access to the labels that the model predicts on specific inputs. And so you can imagine that, for instance, if the model had been trained on sensitive healthcare data, then being part of the data set is itself private information. And so we would not want that information uh, to leak simply by 
uh, uh, simply to an adversary that is able to only observe the labels that the model is predicting. And so I'll come back to how we can prevent this later in the talk. So in the first part of the presentation, I'm going to contrast the work that we've been doing on robustness to adversarial examples, which is uh, one possible uh, threat against the integrity of machine learning systems, with work that we've done uh, towards preventing privacy attacks. And you'll see that we took very different approaches uh, to tackle each of these problems. And this has led to outcomes that are very different. And I think we can learn from the, the mistakes we've made in one area to uh, essentially build more trustworthy machine learning systems in a more principled way. So let me start by a refresher uh, on adversarial examples where uh, you've, you've probably seen that this result where essentially what happens is that if you have access to a machine learning model's architecture, you can use gradients of this model to find perturbations of its test inputs that will force the model to misclassify these test inputs. So for instance here, if I have the image of uh, the digit one and I want the model to misclassify this image, I'm going to compute gradients of the output of the model with respect to the input features and use this to uh, infer a saliency map that tells me when I modify each of the features of the input, how is that going to impact the different outputs of my model? And so once I have this saliency map, it basically allows me as an adversary to choose a target class that I want the model to output, and then to find the features that I should increase in the input in order to increase the model's output uh, for that specific target class. And so this is what the algorithm is doing here in a greedy fashion where it's selecting features that, are, uh, that have positive derivatives uh, for the target class, and then increasing these features, observing the change in the model's output. And then once we've done that for sufficiently many iterations, that is for sufficiently many features, we end up with an input that is misclassified here in the class four that we chose uh, prior to uh, starting this, this attack. And so this, this has now been demonstrated to be a pervasive problem with machine learning models across different algorithms, so deep neural networks, but also logistic regression, decision trees, also across domains. Here I give sort of a MNIST example, sort of the simplest vision problem, but it has been also demonstrated on other domains like reinforcement learning or uh, malware detection. And more worryingly in terms of the security of machine learning systems, we've shown that these attacks are possible even if the adversary does not have access to the model itself. Because if you recall here, this attack and many attacks that have been proposed afterwards rely on the fact that you have access to the gradients of the model in order to find the perturbations that will change its predictions. But what happens when you only have black box access to the model and you can query the model, observe its outputs, uh, is that you can use this query access to extract a copy of the model before you mount uh, the adversarial example attack. So this is going to allow me to uh, make a small diversion uh, on the topic of model extraction, which I think is uh, of a good example of a problem that is a concrete problem that uh, many of the uh, industry actors uh, face today. And so the idea here is that in model extraction, we are able to leverage progress that is made in the machine learning community uh, to learn with little uh, to no supervision. Uh, and so the reason why is that if you think about it, in model extraction, we are trying to learn how to reproduce a model with as few queries as possible. And so the less supervision we need in our learning algorithm, if we're going to extract the model by simply uh, building a training set through the query access we have with the black box, then the less supervision we need, the less queries we'll have to make in order to successfully extract the model. And so in a series of papers uh, on, uh, on this issue, we've demonstrated that, uh, for instance, in uh, Matthew's work here, that we're able to extract models more efficiently if we rely on uh, progress in the semi-supervised learning literature, uh, in particular our work on mixed match. And uh, in, in another example, we've also shown that as more and more uh, researchers rely 
on pre-trained language models and fine-tune these language models to specific tasks, this also further simplifies the task of the adversary when it comes to model extraction because now you know that these language models are all derived from similar models. And so you can, as an adversary, initialize your model extraction with one of these, uh, these popular uh, language models and then yourself fine-tune this model by querying the black box model that you are trying to approximate. So this is something that Kalpesh here uh, demonstrated in, in, in his paper. And so preventing model extraction is hard. Uh, the reason is that if you want your model to be available uh, for query access to legitimate users, then you have to reveal the correct prediction, the prediction that the model is, is making. And so anytime that you try to defend against model extraction, you're necessarily going to have a trade-off with sort of the performance that legitimate users of your model will be able to, to receive. And so one avenue that we've uh, been exploring recently in my group is to rather than try to prevent model extraction, which is hard if not impossible, we try to detect once a model has been extracted. And so the first approach we propose to do this is uh, called dataset inference. And so this is work led by uh, Pratyush and Mohammed in my group, where what they've shown is that you can leverage um, the privacy literature to, and in particular membership inference attacks, to tell when a model was stolen because it was trained on data from your own training set. And so the idea is that every time a model trains on a specific point, then it's going to memorize potentially some of the information contained in that point. And so if you as the model owner have access to the training site, you can use your training points to query the potentially stolen models. And when these models react in a way that you expect is consistent with your training set, then you know that they've been trained on this training set. And so even if the adversary is attempting to dissimulate the model extraction attack, by doing things like fine-tuning or pruning weights and so on, they won't be able to hide the fact that what they are trying to do is to leverage your training data. And so in, in this work, what we've shown is that you can turn the fact that models memorize some of their training data uh, into an advantage that gives an asymmetric advantage to the defender when it comes to model extraction because you have the advantage of having access to the training set that you use to create the model that people may have stolen. Another approach that we've been studying uh, and we proposed recently to uh, resolve ownership uh, questions is proof of learning. So here the idea is to say, well, what if I could demonstrate myself proactively that a model checkpoint is a checkpoint that I've spent the computing resources and I've provided the training data to obtain. And so the idea here is to realize that reproducing stochastic gradient descent is fairly difficult without having access to all the intermediate checkpoints and the associated um, non-determinism uh, with each of these gradient descent step. And so what we've proposed is that proactively a model owner will log all of the information that is necessary to reproduce the stochastic gradient descent and submit that to an auditor when it comes to verifying whether they are indeed the owner or not of a specific model. And so in particular, what we do is that we not only save the intermediate values of the model parameters throughout the training uh, run, so throughout the stochastic gradient descent, but we also uh, store auxiliary information that is necessary to reproduce the gradient descent step deterministically. And so this is information that is associated with the stochasticity of gradient descent, in particular, the specific data points that were sampled for that uh, specific gradient descent step, but also information uh, required to be able to seed uh, this particular step. And so if you'd like to learn more about this work, I encourage you to read our uh, recent paper, Proof of Learning, uh, which uh, several of my students worked on, Nick, Mohammed, Christopher, Natalie, and uh, Envith and Varu. So coming back to the problem of adversarial examples, and, and which was why I sort of uh, started this diversion on model extraction, um, once we have an extracted model, of course, uh, 
we can use white box adversarial example attacks uh, that rely on the gradients of, of the, the stolen model in order to find adversarial examples. And because of a property called transferability uh, that we observed a couple of years ago, these inputs that are misclassified by the extracted model will in turn also be misclassified by the black box model that was the original victim model. And so why did I introduce sort of the topic of adversarial examples is because I want to sort of stop for a minute and, and ask the question sort of what do we do now that we've uh, realized that models are vulnerable to these systematic attacks at test time. Well, what we've done is we've tried to decrease the amount, uh, the sensitivity of models to small perturbations of their test inputs. And so how do, how do we do this? Well, we need to characterize what it means to have a small perturbation here. And the fact that the small, uh, the perturbation is small is characterized in, in the community by saying that uh, the image here of a three uh, is uh, in the center of um, LP ball, which indicates all of the images that should also be classified as a three. And so our challenge that we've been pursuing as a community to make models more robust is to ensure that models here, which uh, are indicated by the, the red dotted line, will actually um, be such that they will make the same prediction in this entire ball around their training input here, three being a training input. And so if we look at the recent uh, results in, in this area, then we'll see that we've actually been able to produce models like this, such as here the black dotted line, where the model is now predicting in a constant way around its entire uh, training input here within this LP ball. And in particular, what this means is that if we, uh, if we take any input in this ball, then it will be classified as a three. The problem is that the LP norm is not going to characterize perfectly the underlying semantics of the problem. And so what this means is that you can find new adversarial examples, which rather than exploit the uh, excessive sensitivity of models to small changes of their input, now exploit the excessive invariance of robust machine learning models to uh, perturbations of their inputs. And in particular here, we give an example where we find an image, which is the image of a five, which is close uh, under the LP norm uh, metric used to characterize robustness in this example to the training image of a three. And so the robust model is going to classify this image here as a three. Whereas if we look at our original model, which was quote unquote unrobust, it would have correctly classified the image as a five. And so here what we see is that there is an inherent tension between robustness and accuracy that is created by the fact that the LP norm is not a good proxy for the underlying semantics of the task. And so we have a chicken and egg problem where here we won't be able to achieve robustness no matter how good we become at increasing uh, sort of the radius of these, um, these balls around the training inputs because at some point the, these balls are going to be necessarily too big. And so the, the issue is that we would, we would need, for instance, to specify um, a radius that is different for each of the training inputs because some inputs might be closer to the decision, the ground truth here, which is the solid black line. Some of the training inputs might be closer to the, to the decision boundary than other training inputs. And so this is, uh, in, in my opinion, why sort of achieving robustness to adversarial examples through uh, LP norms is not going to uh, be conclusive in any way, no matter how much progress we make on that specific task. And so this is sort of a pessimistic conclusion. And we might ask, well, does that mean that we're going to be sort of in this consistent arms race between adversaries and defenders where here we've seen that we have first identify a vulnerability to adversarial examples. So as a community, we made progress and we're able to defend against the specific uh, attack uh, minimizing LP norms. And then now that we've been able to do that, then there are new attacks that we proposed uh, and I recommend reading this paper uh, 
here uh, led by Florian if you want to know more about these new attacks that now evade the quote-unquote robust models. And so this, this really sounds like the start of an arms race and this is something that is commonly found in many areas of uh, system security. In fact, Butler Lampson uh, sort of famously said in, in 2004 that practical security needs to balance the cost of protection with the risk of loss, right? And so this is the same then sort of physical security where if you have a house, you put a lock on your door, it's going to prevent most people from breaking into your house, but it's not gonna prevent a bear which might fall outside your threat model, okay? And so what I'd like you to think about is whether machine learning uh, introduces a paradigm that is sufficiently different that we can now approach security in a more principled way. And I think the, the answer to that question is yes. And the reason is that there are a lot of similarities between machine learning and uh, the field of cryptography. And I'm going to illustrate this with a particular example around data privacy, uh, and in particular, how data privacy is achieved in the framework of differential privacy. So privacy is a very subjective notion. If you ask different people, they will give you different definitions of what they mean by privacy. But fortunately, in the research community, we've agreed on sort of differential privacy, which was uh, proposed by Cynthia Dwork and her collaborators, as sort of the established definition for what it means for an algorithm to be differentially private. The idea is to say, well, my algorithm should produce indistinguishable outputs on two variants of my data set, one variant which contains the record corresponding to an individual, and the second variant which does not contain the record corresponding to that individual. And if these outputs are indistinguishable, then what it means is that an adversary that is observing my algorithm is unable to tell whether I'm operating on this first data set or this second data set, and as a consequence, they cannot know whether this individual contributed their data set or not. And so they cannot, as, as a result, leak uh, any private information contained uh, in this person's record. Of course, if it was perfectly indistinguishable, then it means the algorithm is not going to be able to provide useful analysis. And so we instead have a probabilistic guarantee that bounds the degree to which these two settings are indistinguishable, uh, which is what is uh, stated here in, in this definition where we're looking at the probability that the algorithm M makes a certain output S on a data set D uh, being close to the probability that the algorithm, the same algorithm M makes that same output S on a second data set D prime where D and D prime are such that they only differ by one record and you can uh, you have to verify that this is true for all possible pairs of data sets D and D prime and all outputs S. And so how do we achieve differential privacy in machine learning? There has been several approaches. Um, the, perhaps the most uh, popular is differentially private stochastic gradient descent because it's very versatile. Today I'm going to introduce uh, a second approach that we proposed um, which is called pate because it allows us to uh, really intuitively understand why differential privacy is uh, much more successful in uh, improving machine learning systems than, for instance, research that has been conducted on adversarial examples. Um, and so here, the idea behind Pate is to say, well, rather than train one single model on your data set, let's partition the data set in n subsets of data. And from each of these subsets of data, we're going to train a machine learning model called a teacher independently. So what this means is we have n different models all trained from different data sets to perform the same task. And so the question is how do we have this ensemble of teachers predict in a privacy preserving way? Well we're going to aggregate the, their predictions. Of course if we just take a majority vote then this provides an intuitive notion of privacy because we know the prediction is made uh, by uh, an agreement among multiple models that were trained from different data sets. So intuitively, the prediction doesn't really depend too much on each of these individual uh, subsets of the data. But there are corner cases where if, uh, for instance, about half of the models agree on one label and half of the models agree on another label, then one model might be a tiebreaker or a small number of models might be tiebreakers. And so what this means is that in practice, 
very few uh, data points might have an influence on the outputs that we are predicting. And so in this case, we wouldn't be able to prove differential privacy. And so in order to have a privacy preserving aggregation, we first perturb the votes that the teachers make with random noise before we take a majority vote. And this allows us to obtain a mechanism that is differentially private, which means every time we ask the teachers to make a prediction, if we only see this noisy aggregation, then we have uh, a label that was produced with differential privacy guarantees. And so now we have an extra step, which is there to bound the amount of private information that leaks from this mechanism, because every time that we ask the teachers to make a prediction, a small amount of information that is bounded, but still a small amount of information potentially leaks from that prediction. And so as we make more and more queries, the privacy leakage is uh, potentially becoming larger. And so in order to limit the privacy budget, what we do is that we um, use the predictions of the ensemble of teachers to label a public set of data for a student to learn from. And so what this means is that we are essentially transferring knowledge from this ensemble of teachers in a differentially private way into the student model. And so then once we've done that, we can release the student model and it can answer as many queries as we want because the privacy budget was fixed at the completion of training. So this is an interesting mechanism because first of all, it allows us to see that when most of the teachers agree on a prediction, then this prediction is likely to be correct. So we have generalization, uh, which stems from the fact that they were trained independently from different subsets of data. But also when most of the teachers agree, what this means is that we can introduce more noise to these votes before we aggregate them. And so in turn, what this means is we can prove stronger differentially private guarantees. And so there's this very nice alignment between generalization and differential privacy, where the more agreement we have, the more likely we're generalizing well, and the more private we are. And so this is very, uh, very advantageous. But Pate has another advantage, which is that it naturally leads itself uh, to um, a distributed setup for learning with uh, differential privacy. And so here, what this is something that we showed in our recent work called CAPSI, uh, where uh, a group uh, of my students essentially took the PATE framework and combined it with cryptographic primitives in order to enable the application of PATE in a distributed setting where each of these teachers would be uh, trained by a different party which already had an isolated subset of uh, data. And so here, the idea is, is as follows, is that one of the parties, which would be one of the teachers here, is going to issue, uh, is going to basically play the role, uh, the, the role of the student. So it's going to issue a test query that it will send in an encrypted way to all of the remaining parties. So that would be all of the other teachers. So if it's teacher one, the querying party, then teachers two to N are uh, answering parties. And so these answering parties receive an encrypted input to predict on from the querying party. And they're going to use homomorphic machine learning to be able to produce uh, a logits on this input without having to reveal their model to the querying party or without being able to read the input that the querying party sent. And then these logits are going to be uh, transformed into one hot vectors uh, using a two party protocol. And these one hot vectors are going to be summed and noised by a content service provider, again, using uh, a series of uh, two party protocols in order to produce the histogram in Pate, which is used to perform the majority vote. And once we've done that, we're going to engage in one last two-party protocol where the querying party is going to be able to receive the label that is the noisy argmax produced with differential privacy from the votes of these individual parties. And so what this means is that we get both the guarantees from differential privacy, which allow us to protect the training data of each of these answering parties, but also we get 
guarantees of confidentiality from the use of cryptographic primitives because here these parties don't have to release their models to the querying party and the querying party does not have to reveal what input they've uh, asked the answering parties to predict on. And so here this allows us to uh, enable distributed learning in a setting where each of these parties have heterogeneous architectures. So they don't have to agree on a common model like uh, would be the case, for instance, with federated learning. They can each retain their local model and instead what they're doing is they're exchanging labels to improve these local models uh, while retaining their own architectures and their own training pipelines. And of course, we get guarantees of differential privacy, which uh, you would not get from federated learning, which does not protect privacy. Um, and then the, the other advantage is that this allows us to improve the accuracy of the model and the fairness of the model because we can now rely on the fact that these different parties might have access to data that the querying party does not initially have access to. And so when the querying party gets, for instance, an input from uh, um, a subpopulation that is not well represented in their data set, then they can leverage the predictions of the answering parties to improve their own local models fairness uh, using the noisy labels that they receive. So again, I encourage you to read the, the, the CAPSI learning paper uh, if you're curious about this, this work. Another advantage of learning with differential privacy with things like PATE and CAPSI is that we get guarantees that are robust to the adversary's knowledge and capabilities in the future. So if you recall in the adversarial examples literature, I illustrated how there's an arms race between attackers and defenders. And one perhaps uh, very well-known example of this is gradient masking, where um, there has been a series of defenses that were proposed, which are essentially uh, trying to remove the gradients, or at least to set the gradients to very small values around the inputs that the adversary is going to query in order to make the gradient-based adversarial example algorithms uh, fail because they are not going to be able to optimize for the perturbation. But these defenses can be evaded simply by uh, using a model extraction attack, for instance, a black box attack, because the, uh, the approximated model that you're going to compute your gradients over in order to find adversarial examples uh, is going to have gradients that are informative, that have not been um, modified and uh, altered uh, to be uninformative. And so this is just an example of how in the adversarial examples literature, it's uh, this arms race is led by the fact that we don't have guarantees that are robust to adaptive attacks that adversaries might come up with after we've uh, released our model with a specific defense. Instead, the guarantee that is provided by differential privacy is agnostic to the knowledge or the capabilities that the adversary has. And so what this means is that, uh, for instance, there is a very similar line of defenses that have been proposed to uh, defend against membership inference attacks, where rather than a mask gradients, uh, there has been several approaches that propose to mask the confidence values of the model's predictions, because these confidence values uh, are typically used in membership inference attacks to make it easier to detect when the model is overfitting on what would be a training point. And so one of my students here, Christopher, showed that in fact you can produce label-only membership inference attacks that don't rely on this confidence information. And so what this means is that just like gradient masking uh, defenses were evaded in the case of adversarial examples with a simple black box attack based on transferability, here in the, in the privacy field, you can evade confidence masking defenses simply by using a label only attack that does not rely on the confidence metric. And you, this is shown here where the confidence attack in blue uh, is uh, basically producing the same performance than uh, the dotted line here, uh, which is the orange dotted line here, which is the label only attack. And so, in fact, what we also found in this paper is that the only defense that provides meaningful improvements 
uh, in terms of robustness to membership inference attacks, even uh, to attacks like the label-only membership inference attack that we proposed that was not uh, known at the time that the differentially private models were trained, this, this approach is the only approach that is able to provide guarantees that are robust to future adversaries, such as the label-only membership inference attack. And so this shows the really strong advantage of differential privacy, which uh, allows us to train a model with guarantees that are worst case guarantees that hold uh, in the presence of adaptive adversaries. So this is again why I think differential privacy is a really good example of what we should strive to achieve when we're developing trustworthy machine learning models because whereas in the robustness to adversarial examples case that I uh, illustrated, we had a direct conflict between generalization and robustness to LP norms. In differential privacy, we have this alignment between generalization and differential privacy. And of course, differential privacy provides guarantees that are worst case guarantees that are robust um, to, uh, to adaptive adversaries. Whereas in the case of adversarial examples, uh, defenses like gradient masking are not, uh, are not robust to adaptive adversaries. So just to take a step back here before I enter sort of the last part of my talk, I think this shows that at training time, we need better definitions like differential privacy that will allow us to align machine learning systems with what we as humans uh, view as what makes a trustworthy machine learning system. And so these are our human norms. Um, and so these are, of course, uh, also uh, influenced by, by sort of societal norms. But I think it's an open problem how to define uh, guarantees like differential privacy for other aspects of trustworthy machine learning, such as, for instance, for robustness. And it's also an open problem how to achieve multiple of these guarantees simultaneously. So for instance, in a recent paper, uh, by one of my students, Vinith, uh, what he found is that there's an inherent tension between the fairness of uh, a model's predictions and the privacy of that model's uh, prediction. Um, in particular, uh, this tension is exacerbated in the area of healthcare because of the heavy tails that these datasets have, where the fairness is uh, basically asking you to have good accuracy on the tails of the distribution, whereas privacy is trying to cut the tails of the distribution because that is where you don't have enough examples uh, to learn privately from. So I think this is a very uh, important and uh, unaddressed open problem uh, for, for future research. And so, so far I focused mostly on training time approaches to improve machine learning systems. But there is also a whole realm of uh, problems at the test time phase. And there the, the idea is to sort of manage all of the limitations of our machine learning systems, which we haven't captured uh, and haven't been able to mitigate at training time. And I'm going to give uh, three specific examples here before I conclude. The first one is in mission control, where we'd like to basically be able to um, tell whether a specific input-output pair is not an input-output pair that we want to reveal for our model because the model's prediction is not made with sufficient ev evidence in the training data to support that prediction. And so uh, in, in my group, we've been revisiting an approach uh, that we proposed a couple years ago called the Deep Canyers Neighbors, um, where the idea is to say, let's try to identify the support that the training data provides for a specific prediction by performing a nearest neighbor search in each of the intermediate representations of a model. So here you can see we have our test input, and here each of these is the representation space learned by that model uh, at a given layer um, in, in the deep neural network. And the little uh, drawings here correspond to how training points are projected uh, on that representation space. So you can see on a legitimate test input, what happens is that the point is being projected in the representation space 
in, in a way that it's surrounded by training points in the representation space when we perform a nearest neighbor search. Instead, when we predict on out of distribution inputs and for instance on adversarial examples, then we see that initially the, uh, the input is projected in a part of the, the representation space that is either ambiguous or from the correct class corresponding to the adversarial example. And then that as we go up the different layers, the, the representation becomes ambiguous in the sense that it's surrounded by different uh, inputs from different classes in the training set. And then eventually it's surrounded by inputs from the wrong class. And so what this means is that if we analyze the neighbors that are um, found across the different architectures, then we see that when we have support for a prediction in the training set, then there is homogeneity in the different labels that we record across the different layers. Whereas when we have very little support from the training set, there is a lot more heterogeneity in the labels that we are looking at. And so we've uh, recently improved upon th these initial results to provide uh, statistically meaningful p-values uh, associated with this way to estimate the uncertainty of a model's prediction. And so this allows us to reject certain inputs as inputs that we cannot predict on uh, given the training set and the model that we have uh, trained. The second approach that I wanted to discuss is uh, how to manage a model once it has been deployed and uh, in particular how to handle cases where we realize that some of the training points that we analyzed to create that model are no longer training points that we want to learn from. So this can come from two, uh, two cases. First, we might realize that some of these training points were poison, and so we simply don't want to retain any of the poison behavior. And the second example is when users want to delete their training points, uh, and this has been popularized by uh, several legal frameworks for data privacy. And so here the idea is we want to patch the model once we've trained and deployed it, to be able to unlearn what it has learned from some of the training points. So why is this something that we cannot approach with differential privacy, which I've discussed fairly extensively in this talk so far? Well, the idea is that here we want to provide a guarantee that is specific to one or a small number of points in the training set. Whereas differential privacy bounds how much we learn from any training example. And so here what this would mean is that in differential privacy, we would have to have perfect indistinguishability between the two data sets uh, in order to have unlearned from a specific point, which would mean that we would not have learned at all from, uh, from, the, from any of the points that are in our training set, uh, which of course uh, makes the model uh, unusable. Machine unlearning is also made difficult by the fact that uh, for models like deep neural networks, we use optimizers like stochastic gradient descent, where stochastic, stochasticity comes in as we are sampling different uh, training points and also in the learning objective itself because we might have multiple minima. And so this makes it very difficult to estimate the influence of each training example on the different parameters uh, of the model or on the different predictions made by the model. And this is uh, in particular uh, shown by the fact that stochastic gradient descent is incremental. And so as soon as we've introduced a point in training, it is very difficult to estimate what is its influence for the remaining steps of, of stochastic gradient descent. So the way that we define machine unlearning is rather strict, but allows us to come back to users and give them a convincing guarantee that their data has indeed not influenced the model in any ways. And so the idea is to say that the distribution of models that we obtain by first learning, then unlearning uh, the point should be the same than the distribution of models that we would have obtained without learning from that point uh, at all in the first place. And so this is uh, a definition that is appealing to the user because that is very intuitive and uh, reflects sort of the fact that we don't want our data to influence the model in any ways. 
but this also makes it very difficult to achieve this definition of machine unlearning. So the way that we approached it is uh, by introducing an approach for training deep neural networks and in particular uh, and more generally any model that can be trained with stochastic gradient descent um, in a way that makes it easier to limit both the number of steps that are impacted by a training example uh, but also the number of parameters. And so we introduced two knobs to do this uh, and the approach is called Sharded Isolated Sliced Aggregated Training, or CESA, because the first knob is sharding and the second knob is slicing. So in sharding, the idea is similar to pâté, where we're going to split our data set and partition it into uh, different shards of data. And so what this means is we're now training uh, an ensemble of models rather than a single model, and so each of these models here in the ensemble is only trained on a subset of the data. So if, for instance, I want to unlearn this specific data point, I only need to retrain uh, a smaller number of parameters that correspond to this model of the ensemble rather than train the larger model that I would have obtained from this entire data set. The second knob is slicing, where rather than train each of these models as we would usually using stochastic gradient descent, where we analyze all of the training examples in each epoch of stochastic gradient descent, we're going to gradually introduce the data in the shard in, uh, in a specific way. So the idea is to say, well, let's slice this shard, which is essentially splitting the shard in um, R different slices. And what we're going to do is we're going to start training on one of the slices of this shard and then save the model parameters after we've, done, we've uh, trained on this first slice. We're then going to introduce the second slice and continue training the model on the first and second slices combined, save the model parameters again, and so on and so on by introducing more data and saving the model parameters after we've, we're done introducing um, these, these new slices. And so what this means is when we want to unlearn a specific point, all we have to do is uh, figure out which slice it was introduced in, and then we can load the model parameters that were saved the last time before we introduced that slice, and then resume training from, uh, from that state rather than a random initialization. And so by combining the sharding and the slicing, we're effectively making uh, machine unlearning a lot faster than if we had to naively retrain the model from scratch. And so this is something that uh, uh, a group of my students demonstrated in, in a paper called Machine Unlearning that uh, you can find on my website. So to conclude, I, I will say that there, there are really two parts of the talk. The first one is, is showing that at training time, we need to align machine learning models and machine learning systems with human norms. And so I've discussed examples from security and privacy in particular, but of course there are other human norms that we might uh, want to ensure our models satisfy, such as fairness or ethical concerns. The second part of the talk emphasizes how at test time, there are mechanisms that we need to deploy in order to ensure that uh, we are able to mitigate some of the limitations that we won't have addressed at training time. And so I've shown how unlearning is one of such approach, but also abstaining from predicting uh, with the deep K nearest neighbors. Finally, something that I haven't had the time uh, to discuss today is the fact that sometimes technical solutions are not enough to address uh, the trustworthiness of machine learning. And in particular, you can find a think piece here at the bottom of the slide, uh, which uh, illustrates how in the field of uh, detection of deep fakes, purely approaching it from a technical perspective is not going to lead to long-term solutions. Uh, and this is due to the, to the technology involved to uh, generate deepfakes and in particular generative adversarial networks. So I encourage you to, uh, to look at that think piece if you want to know more about that specific angle. Finally, I know that sometimes as computer security researchers, we have a lot of negative messages about the limitations of, um, of systems, and in particular here, machine learning systems, I want to clarify that I view uh, trustworthy machine learning as an opportunity to make machine learning better. And again, this is exemplified 
uh, with our work on differential privacy for machine learning, where we can see that by making machine learning models differentially private, we're essentially improving their generalization, uh, which shows that we're uh, essentially helping machine learning researchers achieve the most fundamental goal uh, in machine learning. And what I mean by this is that I believe that by making models more trustworthy, we're essentially allowing machine learning researchers to improve their machine learning systems even in domains where we might not care about things like security or privacy. And so I'm really excited to see how we are going to be able to apply some of the findings from trustworthy machine learning research into more broader application domains uh, for machine learning. And finally, I wanted to just take the time to acknowledge that a lot of the work that I've discussed today was produced by uh, my some of my students. And so I took the liberty here of showing their uh, photos so that you can uh, see as well their names and contact them if you have any questions on, on the work that they've done. Thank you for your attention and I look forward to your questions. I'm available always uh, through email uh, as well as Twitter. Thank you.